Okay, we're live and uh, people are rolling in. Yeah, welcome everybody. Um, it's uh, MNR Day, Wednesday MNR Day, and today it's great. We have uh, Gary Egbert speaking on something that anyone who does DPM has to worry about modeling the uh, external source field for in, in induction studies. So uh, before I introduce Gary, just a quick reminder where to go. If you're not that familiar with MNRs, you go on the MTNet MNR page, and there you can see the previous uh, MNRs, uh, video links and presentations, and then registration for uh, upcoming ones. So you are on a, a webinar, so you can set your audio settings, you can send a message to the panelists. Um, Q&A, uh, please send all your questions in the Q&A and at the end I'll read these out. And then if you want to speak um, and we, we encourage this, please raise your hand and I'll uh, authorize your audio uh, to speak. So to, to, uh, before I introduce Gary quickly, uh, next week, advertisement for next week, Jared Peacock, He's going to try and convince us about a particular format we all should be moving to for MT time series data. And I think, I think this is wonderful because we don't really have one. Uh, you know, we have EDI for the responses you know, with all its faults and whatever, but uh, we don't have one for time series. So today we got Gary Egbert and Gary and I, we go way back, Gary, to uh, EMS lab days, right? 1987 or something. <laughs> and, That's uh, right. Yeah, modeling the spatial structure of external source field for induction studies. And many of you know Gary is this uh, his processing codes, his inversion codes. You might not know his ocean side as much. Uh, Gary's professor at Oregon State, mathematics, statistics, and geophysics degrees. So, superb grounding. 35 years of research in EM, geophysics, and physical oceanography. Uh, multivariate studies, numerical modeling, inv inverse methods. Gary's motivated by a range of specific real world problems from electrical conductivity to ocean tides, and he's developed 3D inversion and data assimilation methodologies. And so at that, I'll uh, stop my share, Gary, and hand over to you. So I have to start my share? Yep. And I gotta not do the whiteboard. Okay, well, as Alan already said, I'm gonna talk about modeling spatial structure of external source fields. Uh, and I'm gonna to try to focus on induction studies, but I'm gonna also try to make the point that there's probably a lot of other reasons and you know, GIC, which is something that's been very big in our community recently is, is certainly one of those. Um, so uh, an outline of the talk, um, I'm gonna start with a, a, a bit of a, motiv a motivation and overview. And then I'm gonna describe the approach that uh, has been de we've developed so far and illustrate it with a summary of a paper that was published in GGI last year uh, entitled Modeling Diurnal Variation Magnetic Fields Due to Ionosphere Currents. Uh, and, uh, and then I'm gonna talk uh, about a, a more recent uh, work that's an application of the source model that we've developed to trying to constrain uh, transition, mantle transition zone conductivity on a global average so far. And that's work with uh, Chang Hui Chen. And then I'm gonna say a few words about refinements and extension and ongoing work. Uh, you know, incorporating transfer function ideas into this source, mo uh, source modeling, um, how this can be adapted to satellite data, or we're trying to do that right now. And then uh, uh, the, the first, the core presentation is gonna be about diurnal variation fields, but uh, I'll maybe try to mention a little bit about shorter and longer periods that we're working on also. Um, so the original motivation, I've been working on this for quite a while, and my motivation was to image deep mantle electrical conductivity. And I think this is an important, a potentially important thing because uh, we could provide, MT can all provide obviously additional constraints on the, physical state of the Earth's interior, and um, uh, getting into the mantle, deeper into the mantle, would really provide us maybe some important 
uh, uh, information. And, and one of the reasons for that is that conductivity is extremely sensitive to water content, and that's in contrast to seismic data. And uh, there are people who are worried about or study and are interested in, you know, in water in the earth, in the solid earth. And um, the, the evidence is that there's quite a bit more water in the solid earth, or really hydrogen ions is what it really is, uh, that, that, uh, than in the, in the uh, hydrosphere. So the oceans are really only a small fraction of the hydrogen in the earth. And the distribution of, of, uh, of this has significant implications for rheology, melting, uh, geodynamics, and earth history. And uh, this is just a figure of some of, of a, a paper, a recent paper, a review paper on water in the earth, just showing kind of like hi hypothetical ideas of, of what water content would be in different, in different parts, different layers in the earth. And you'll see that the transition zone uh, uh, between 410 and 670 kilometers is actually has a potentially a very large amount of water. Uh, and that's, that's because the minerals in the transition zone have very high solubilities for hydrogen ions. Um, so MT is great for imaging the lithosphere. Um, and I think a lot of the people attending this are probably focused on MT, but uh, getting to the very long periods required to image say down into the transition zone and try to constrain water content is very challenging. So I, I have a couple of figures here. Uh, one of them on the, on the left is, is one of the best EarthScope TA long period MT sites. And it was about a you know, one month, nominally one month deployment. And on the other, uh, on the right, uh, a, a good-ish EarthScope backbone site. And that nominally had a three-year deployment. And um, you can see that with the three-year deployment, you can kind of push out past the 10, 20,000 seconds that we can pretty much easily get to with long period MT. But you know, things start to fall apart pretty quickly. And you really only get out to 30, 40,000 seconds before uh, the transfer functions become much less reliable. So it's very challenging to measure electric fields uh, at these very long periods, because due to the physics of induction where the, uh, the EM fields penetrate deeper and deeper into the earth, the electric fields at the surface become very small. And uh, we also have to deal with the fact that the deep conductivity is, is very much increased relative to the shallower conductivity. So once you get into the lower mantle, you know, the kind of just the normal background conductivity is one semen per meter. Um, so, so the E fields become very small at long periods. On the, on the other side, the noise spectrum is very red. There's all kinds of temperature effects, self-potential effects, electrode noise. And so it becomes very, and, and the source is also very highly polarized at very long periods. So it becomes very, very challenging to get MT to go much past 20 or 30,000 seconds. So we need to go to longer periods, periods of a day or so to see into the transition zone. So we need to use a different approach. And, uh, we all have learned about geomagnetic depth sounding. I guess I like to call it magnetovariational approach, but either one is okay, GDS or MV. And for a 1D layered earth, um, so uh, this is 1D, it's easy to show that uh, from a ratio of the vertical magnetic field to the horizontal divergence of the horizontal magnetic fields, you can get something C, the C response, which is basically a scaled uh, 1D impedance of the earth. Um, so you can get part of the MT information without electric fields at all. Um, obviously, you can't get kind of the galvanic or charge uh, uh, parts or the TM part of the response uh, if you're only using magnetic fields, um, since the vertical magnetic field is by definition only present uh, in is not present in the transverse magnetic uh, component. So I'll come back to this later in the presentation. Uh, but um, in fact, of course, the, the magnetovariational approach predates MT significantly. And really it was almost a century ago that uh, Chapman and his students showed that the earth was very conductive below about 600 kilometers depth, which we now understand is due to a phase transition to Bridgmanite in the lower mantle. Um, 
it wasn't really understood why it was much more conductive at that at the time this was discovered. But th so this was discovered by assuming a ring current source, which is really the dominant source at the longest periods, uh, a loop of current um, around the Earth, uh, which causes uh, a, a P10 dipole source on the Earth's surface. And you can get this C of omega from a local ratio of field components, BZ over BX. And, and really, this is the kind of the original kind of induction uh, technique that was used in the early days. Um, oops. Uh, since that time, of course, a lot has happened. Um, and um, these uh, C responses have been inverted uh, in 3D with 3D inversions. I'm just showing an older study, which I was involved in here. Um, and it used 59 mid-latitude observatories, 28 periods from five to 100 days, made this P10 source assumption with some correction for auroral currents, and took the C responses from Fuji and Schultz, 10, to 10 by 10 numerical grid, uh, tried to correct for the shallow conductivity variations in the oceans. And the net result of this was uh, the suggestion from this 3D inversion that there were large conductivity variations in the transition zone, which were interpreted as variable hydration. Now, in fact, uh, um, the period range in this was not really ideal for imaging the transition zone. So I'm a little bit dubious about the conclusion, the robustness of the conclusion. So I think there were a lot of limitations to this early study. Uh, one of them was the small number of observatories used, and there were very few in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, there were still source complications at high latitudes, and by high, I mean anything greater than 50 degrees or maybe even 45 degrees. Um, and as I already mentioned, the very limited peri period range severely limits resolution in the upper mantle. So really, to get into this upper mantle um, and into the transition zone, you need to use daily variations uh, periods, so periods of like hours to a day or two. And um, this is very challenging to do because, uh, because these sources have, uh, the current sources for these fields are in the near Earth ionosphere. And they have very, can have very small spatial scales and uh, are very challenging uh, to uh, estimate accurately what the spatial structure is. So I'll also say that there's a lot of progress that has been made and a lot of work has been done. And I think maybe you've even heard some of it on this MNR series, um, you, you know, like looking at satellite data and other things. But I think that there's still um, a need for uh, uh, esti improved estimates of the source fields, especially in this daily variation band. And that's really what the focus of this talk is about. So Alan mentioned that I did work on um, oceanography and I thought I'd just give a, a short aside on, on, on what I did because what I'm doing now with the source field estimation is really kind of building on a big part of my scientific career, which was spent on oceanographic data simulation with a focus on ocean tides. So I got into this uh, just by chance because uh, at the time of, of ac when accurate uh, satellite radar altimetry was coming uh, online with the Topex Poseidon altimeter, um, they required very accurate corrections for the tides, like, which they considered a source of noise for the oceanographic climate signal, longer period oceanographic climate signal that they wanted to observe with this altimeter. So this basically led to a lot of funding and effort on tidal modeling. And I became involved with an oceanographer who was approaching this uh, estimation as an inverse problem. I knew something about inverse problem. I bumped into an, him in a coffee shop and we chatted and uh, one thing led to another. Um, and uh, the approach we took is kind of the, the most rigorous approach to data simulation, so-called variational data simulation. Fortunately, uh, it was for a very simple physical problem of, of tides. And I'm not gonna say much of anything about this, but to those of us who work on inversion in EM, I think you sort of see a penalty functional down there that looks very, very familiar. You know, there's a, there's a kind of a data misfit and there's kind of something that looks like a regularization term. Well, the regularization term in this case really involves the dynamical equations rather than some simple, you know, derivative term. So uh, 
the, it, it, but you can formulate data simulation in this way. And it was a very familiar problem to me. So I got involved in it. And uh, so we use a dynamic, I mean, effectively, when you understand all of this, we're using the dynamical model, which was the shallow water equations on the sphere to interpolate the data, which was the altimetry and tide gauges in a physically consistent manner. So the interpolation kind of tries to say, stay close to the physics of, of tidal propagation. And this is, a, this is kind of a movie of, of, of ocean tides for one day based upon um, the inversion work that we did. And I still have people working on this myself right now. So I guess there's one key point which is relevant to what I want to talk about. And that is a physics-based numerical model can help provide realistic basis functions, which can be used to interpolate sparse data sets. And when you go through all of the mathematics in the inverse problem, that's what it comes out to be. And these techniques are, of course, very widely used in the atmospheric and oceanographic sciences. And I think they're starting to be used in space sciences too. So a second key point, which I think I wanted to make a, that it's, is a, less, a lesson from, uh, from this is that the tidal models, not he tidal models, the tidal models, which were initially motivated as a correction of a source of noise that the oceanographers wanted to get rid of, has actually led to many scientific results and also many unexpected applications. And I think the same thing will happen if we develop better models of the external source fields. Uh, I think we'll be surprised at some things that we can do now, do with those that we never think of when we start up the process. So this is just an example. Uh, that, that comes back to the induction case, um, uh, a, a side product of the, the tidal model is the tidal currents in the ocean. And you can combine the tidal currents with the Earth's magnetic field to generate the uh, motional induction source fields for uh, tidal uh, induction. And th this is a, an example of uh, the radial component of the magnetic field at satellite altitude, which was used in a mantle conduct conductivity study by Alexander Graver uh, and his colleagues. Uh, and so this is something that, you know, I can tell you was never imagined or thought of when we started working on developing uh, tidal models. Actually, I might've thought about it a little bit, but the, I can tell you the people who are funding it weren't thinking about this. So um, I, I, I wanna use these ideas uh, in modeling diurnal variations of the magnetic fields due to ionospheric currents to improve induction studies. So uh, as I said, this is a paper that was published last year in GJI and it's work with uh, Patrick Alkin at University of Colorado and Astrid Maut, Mote, I'm sorry, uh, at uh, NCAR High Altitude Observatory. She's an ionospheric physicist and Hui Chan Chang. Um, so, we developed a global model for ionospheric source currents, uh, just a two-dimensional equivalent sheet current model uh, in the daily variation band, which is roughly 10 to the fourth to 10 to the fifth seconds. The uh, model is actually for all geomagnetic conditions, so not just quiet times. Uh, it has an hourly cadence because I used hourly means for the uh, data constraints. And it combines ground data from the observatories and uh, outputs of a physics-based ionospheric model, the thermosphere ionosphere electrodynamics general circulation model, or TIE-GCM. And the approach that I'm taking, I think, can be viewed as a simplified data simulation scheme, which is basically going to use basis functions derived from the TIE-GCM to interpolate sparse data on the ground and ultimately in from satellites too. So the approach has three key steps, which I'm going to re relatively quickly review. So it starts with a, a, an analysis of the ground data with frequency domain principal components. And so this is something that, you know, I guess I've been talking about for a long time, um, actually since about the time I first met Alan, uh, this is what my PhD was on. Uh, so from this, I can decompose uh, the ground data in the frequency domain into data modes, which are sampled sparsely in space at the ground observatories. And in the frequency domain as a sequence of Fourier coefficients in a sequence of continuous time, continuous sequence of time windows uh, 
which I would call the temporal data modes. Then second, I'm going to use the TIE GCM basis functions to interpolate the data modes in space so that I then have something that's continuous in space. And then I'm going to invert the temporal modes back to the time domain. And the result is a global model, as I'll show, of uh, daily variation magnetic fields on the ground uh, that is continue global, continuous in space, and continuous in time. So the first step is the data modes, which are derived from frequency domain principal components analysis of observatory data. And the results I'm going to show you were based on 127 out of 182 geomagnetic observatories that ran for at least a few years, some of the time, most of them for most of the time, between 1997 and 2018. And um, the, the principal components analysis can be viewed as this decomposition into products of spatial modes and temporal modes. And um, I use uh, this crisscross or regression approach, which I developed with Maxim Smirnoff, which uh, makes it possible to have large gaps at some of the sites and missing data. Um, I, I guess I could go into that if anybody has questions, but I think I'll just sort of, I've talked about it before, so I think I'll just uh, say that we alternately fit the spatial modes, which I'm denoting with red, and the temporal modes, which I'm uh, denoting as green, using a robust regression scheme, going back and forth between the two. Um, so the result of this is a series of spatial modes, and I do this in this decade-wide frequency uh, band of 10 to the 5th to 10 to the minus 4th hertz, 10 to the minus 5th to 10 to the minus 4th hertz, uh, which is in a total of 11 frequency bands, and I have I save 20 modes per band. This is uh, mode one at one cycle per day, plotted uh, as uh, horizontal components of the complex magnetic field. This is all in the frequency domain. Everything is complex, plotted at the observatory locations. So these are the magnetic fields, and they're, the red parts are, are imaginary. The blue parts are real, so they're all complex. These are the spatial variations of magnetic fields that is the, has the largest amount of variance at one cycle per day. The temporal mode is a sequence of complex FOIA coefficients for each time window. And as it shows on the bottom, that spans from 1997 to 2018. Um, and you can see the 11 year solar cycle in this and uh, a lot of other things. Okay, the second step, is to interpolate the data modes, which are sparse. So again, these are the data modes here. Uh, I don't know whether you can see my cursor, the, the, sp the spatial data mode. My goal now is to make that into a continuous function, which is defined everywhere on the globe. And to do that, I'm going to use basis functions, fit those, uh, mode, those data modes with basis functions derived from the TIE GCM uh, model run. So we had a one year runs, we had two of them. Uh, one was for 2002, which was solar maximum. One was from 2009, which is solar minimum. And the outputs were processed with a principal components analysis, uh, essentially identical to what was used for the observatory data, except we can do it much more simply because, uh, you know, we have everything's on a regular grid, uh, can be converted to spherical harmonics. Uh, there's no missing data, et cetera. So it can be done with just a singular value and composition uh, very simply. And what I'm showing you here are, again, one cycle per day. So this is just an example. There's a, a whole bunch of frequency bands and a whole bunch of modes. Here are five different modes plotted as stream functions again. So this is the dominant mode, which is basically kind of an SQ uh, and additional modes. And you can see the additional modes become uh, much more dominated by high latitude auroral uh, current systems. Um, so then these basis functions are used to fit the data modes uh, with damped least squares. And in doing this, we account for induced internal fields, um, so far using a relatively simple 1D plus thin sheet surface layer model. So it's, it's a 1D earth, 1D radially, uh, only varying radially, but with the oceans and continents represented through a thin sheet. Um, uh, 
in, in most of the work that I'm showing you, although I'm not sure this is so true, as I've said in this slide, uh, BZ is more sensitive to the conduct to the unknown conductivity model. So we only fit the horizontal components to determine the uh, source fields. So, um, and that's sort of illustrated here. This is uh, uh, the first mode in the three cycle per day band. Um, and and the, this is the total magnetic fields taking the, the surface, the total surface magnetic fields computed from the estimated source with a 1D, purely 1D model on the left and with a 1D plus thin sheet model on the right. And you can see that BZ is much more severely affected. You see these kind of coastlines and things much more clearly. Okay, we jumped forward, sorry. Okay, so um, again, um, this is a spatial mode at one, at mode one at three cycles per day. So this is the input data that was used to fit that model that I showed on the previous slide. This is the fit. This is, uh, th this is after I have uh, fit, the, fit it and sampled the uh, model at the uh, observatory locations. And you can see that it's pretty good, but if you look at it carefully for a while, you'll see some discrepancies. So we don't actually, of course, fit the capture of everything. So like, for example, uh, in, in, the, uh, in Antarctica here, we're not doing very well at all. Um, so, but the fitted model is global and I can evaluate it at any latitude and longitude. And uh, this is again, that same, the same thing that I showed you here. So this is sampled at the observer, the, the model sampled at the observatory locations. And this is the model sampled on a regular grid and you can see that it's actually a relatively smooth, uh, well-defined uh, um, model. And the, the key point is, is that we're using, we're getting the basis functions for this, a relatively small number of basis functions that are physically consistent with this TIE GCM as to do this interpolation and fitting process. Um, this is another representation of source estimates. The source estimates can be represented because we're only, um, as an equivalent current sheet. So this is, uh, as I'll come back to in a second, uh, later in the talk, rather, uh, we, we need to think about three-dimensional current systems when we try to do, use satellite data. But so far, I'm using only ground data, and we can kind of represent uh, everything with an equivalent current system. So this is the equivalent sheet current at 110 kilometers for mode one, one cycle per day, and mode one, three cycles per day. And I'll just say that most of the variance in the first 20 data modes can be stably fit with smooth source current sheets like this. This is just showing the amount of variance explained uh, for the first 10 modes um, for, for all of the 11 frequency bands. Uh, so the, the, the blue curve up here is mode one and so on. So these are, and as you sort of see, as you go down in the mode number, so the modes have less actual signal in them and more noise, the fit becomes poorer and poorer. Also the first, the highest modes, the, the dominant modes tend to be spatially simpler and thus easier to sort of a fit with the TIE uh, basis functions. Okay, so those are the first two steps. So now we have some, something that's continuous in time and continuous in space, but the, the continuous in time is really uh, illustrated by these by the plot that I showed you before of these uh, sequence of discrete FOIA coefficients um, uh, in the frequency domain. But I can convert this into uh, temporal basis functions by inverting the FOIA coefficients from this short time uh, FOIA transform with overlapping windows. It's straightforward to invert that back to the time domain and you get modes uh, that look like this. So actually I'm only showing you uh, a 20 day window because actually if you show like something like this, you can't see anything except the envelope of the oscillations. But this is mode one, mode two, mode three, mode 10. These are at one cycle per day. And I'm showing you this at a time window that I'm going to use for some of the other things I'm going to show, which is in a transition from a quiet time. So this is the quiet time to an active time. So in the quiet time, uh, Kp, this is Kp plotted down here, was on the order of one. In the active time, it was on averaging four and peaking at seven. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you some results from this also. Uh, 
but the, the key point is, is that I can go from, from these, the frequency domain back to the time domain. Um, and actually, I, uh, you keep the comp complex nature in the time domain with the Hilbert transform. So again, this is just sort of a, a repetition of what I've just, of what I've just been showing you. Uh, we interpolate these, the, the, the spatial modes from the principal components analysis of the data to get this, these spatial variation functions. And we have the temporal modes, which are time, continuous functions of time sampled at once per hour. Um, and the sum over all of the bands and all of the modes is a model of the magnetic field in, in uh, the daily variation frequency band global for the time window 1997 to 2018. So um, I'm gonna now compare, show you some comparisons between the data, which is the blue curves, uh, the projection onto the 20 PCA modes. So basically I'm only keeping some of the data signal and then the fitted global model in red. So the projection under the 20 PCA modes is black. It's probably a little hard to see this, but I think what you can sort of see is especially during quiet times uh, and at mid latitudes and even in the auroral zone, um, the, uh, the fitted global model captures the, the time variations of the magnetic fields at these sites quite well in both BX and BY components. Uh, I'm not showing you BZ here. It's not quite as good because we didn't fit those. And also BZ is in fact more affected by the sort by the magnetic, by the earth conductivity, which is certainly not perfect in this model. So uh, one site that was not so good in this is, is Juan Cayo in Peru on the equatorial electrojet. And we believe that, that the failure here is probably because of limited resolution in some of the post-processing that was done in the TIE GCM and that this can be improved. So this is the same time interval as on the previous slide, uh, quiet conditions and then storm time. The fit of the model is not quite as good in the storm time, but it's really not too bad. It really captures the main features of the storms uh, even, even with this, um, Thing. So this is a comparison between data and uh, the fitted global model, um, but at validation sites, which were not included in the model construction. So if I, I guess I maybe failed to mention that, but there were 182 sites and I only used 127. And that's because some of them didn't have data for very many, uh, for, for very much time. And some of them uh, also were very dense in Europe. So I thinned it things out to get a more globally representative thing. So these are some sites that were omitted uh, for one reason or another. And th this is sort of showing that in fact, even for these omitted sites, uh, we do really quite well in reproducing the daily variation fields, both in the quiet times and in active times. And we do best at mid latitudes. Um, but I, I was actually kind of astounded at this uh, 80 degree latitude so this is kind of above the auroral uh, oval, uh, but it, the fit is really quite astoundingly good, even though there's quite, it, it, there's some quite a bit of activity during this time. So uh, this is a first cut at this model, but I think, and it can obviously be improved, I think. So these are some snapshots of the model. Uh, two, two, uh, one, two days sampled six hours apart from the 21 day time window, the first, the left column is from uh, uh, the quiet time and the, the right column is from the active time. And so these are again plotted as stream functions and the units are kiloamps. And you should notice that, uh, that the plotting ranges are, are quite different between uh, the two uh, windows plotted. So uh, the amplitudes in the auroral zone become you know, very extreme during the active times. And the point is the model that I have, I could construct a picture like this for any times in the model interval from 1997 to 2018. And um, here's a little movie, um, again, for the same time period, uh, showing uh, the day variation over the earth. And at first we're in, the, in that quiet window and it kind of gets a little more active. And you'll sort of see when it gets really active, I'll let it go and it goes crazy.
and tapers off. So um, that's the uh, model that was published in the day in the GJI. Um, and uh, we're now um, with work with uh, Chang Hui Chen uh, working on uh, Man, you know, trying to use the model to constrain mantle conductivity. And uh, for our first effort, we uh, focused on doing a global 1D inversion uh, using a fixed thin sheet model and uh, tried to estimate, try to improve the 1D model of conductivity and then use it to constrain conductivity in the average conductivity or at least average conductivity beneath the continents in the transition zone. And uh, these are the sites used uh, in this study. And uh, the misfit to uh, the amplitude of BZ uh, with the sign uh, indicated by color, amplitude and, and, and sign indicated by color. So these, these uh, very pale colors uh, are, are oops, these very pale colors are, are, are fit, fitting within, you know, five, 10% or, or better. Um, uh, the, the dark colors the fit is not very good. Um, and you can sort of see that, uh, that where we have problems is um, near the coastlines, in the ocean, and near the electrojets. So we omitted these sites from our initial global inversion and focused on the sites that could fit best. And they're kind of at mid latitudes and over the continents and not too far, and usually not too close to the coast. Okay. so. Uh, Here's, here's a, a results. We inverted the first five data modes, uh, four periods, one, two, three, four cycles per day, using an Occam inversion um, uh, with a fixed thin sheet. Uh, we started from two different 1D profiles uh, from Puta and, and uh, et al., um, Alexei Kushinov's group, and uh, the 1D model that was used in that, that um, 3D inversion that I showed you at the beginning. Um, and the resolution is best in the mantle transition zone, and that's what I want to focus on. And the, the, the main result is that it's, it's relatively constant over the, oh, excuse me, it's relatively constant over the transition zone, and it's of, of order 30 to 50 uh, ohm meters mostly. So, uh, because we know that the Earth is 3D, uh, and we know that we don't have such a perfect representation of the shallow structure, uh, we did some tests uh, with synthetic data to see whether uh, the, the global inversions that we did uh, should be trusted at all. Um, and we uh, did a bunch of synthetic, uh, generated a bunch of synthetic data sets using the source models that we had. Um, and we did some checkerboards with uh, different sizes in the lithosphere, upper mantle, transition zone, and different combinations of these, as well as a model um, based upon uh, a, a global VS uh, model uh, scaled into um, uh, conductivity with a simple scaling relationship. And all of these models have plus and minus half order of magnitude deviation from the 1D background, which was determined from the inversion result. Um, and uh, th this is uh, the result of, of uh, those tests uh, plotting the ratio of the true uh, average conductivity beneath all of the sites used and the conductivity that was returned by the inver inversion of this 3D synthetic data set. And, uh, the, the bottom line is, so, so okay, the uh, color indicates uh, which synthetic model was used. So there's five different synthetic models in this plot. Um, the circles with black outlines are the global uh, inversions where we fit all the sites simultaneously. The circle with no outline are selected single site inversions. And what you can sort of see is the single site inversions uh, are not reliable at all. Uh, they're all over the place up to two orders of magnitude uh, incorrect. Uh, the uh, global inversion results, on the other hand, all produce correct results within a factor of less than two. Uh, in, so we're plotting here the results for two layers, upper mantle, which is 250 to 410, and the upper mantle transition zone. Um, 
So we did a bunch of other tests. We, uh, instead of in omitting some of the sites, used all the sites, uh, used geomagnetically active versus quiet times only, uh, fit only the best determined first mode. And the bottom line is all of these variants yield similar results, uh, again, within less than a factor of two, uh, the same as what we got when we did what we did for the preferred model. Um, so then if we combine uh, the inversion results with lab data, and as, as those who have followed that know, there are, there, are some, there are some arguments and discrepancies on in the lab data. So we're now talking about focusing on the mantle transition zone. So we're talking about lab results for the phases Wadsleyite and Ringwoodite. And um, rather remarkably, uh, it turns out that, that both the Karato group and the Yoshino group uh, produce very similar conclusions for the uh, conductivities about water content for the conductivities that we uh, observe from the inversion. And the net result of this is that for the upper mantle, uh, 0 0.01 weight percent, um, which is actually uh, quite consistent with uh, uh, water content observed in MORB, um, mid-ocean ridge basalts. Um, and for the mantle transition zone, the best estimate is uh, roughly 0 0.02 weight percent. Uh, if we consider uncertainties, uh, um, you know, like the, for example, from the three dimensional, the true three dimensionality, where we assumed 1D and the different data sets, we conclude that, uh, that the, the water content could be as high as 0.1 weight percent, but not significantly higher. And that is still very, very far below saturation uh, of the mantle transition zone. So water content, so our conclusion is that the mantle transition zone on at least beneath the continents where we actually have data and on an average is relatively dry. Um, I, I wanna show you this as a lead in to, the, uh, to my, my next talk, but also to make the point that, uh, you know, we, we did try to account for the, for the you know, conduct, conductivity of the, of the crust through this thin sheet model, but, but there really are quite large, potentially quite large variations in conductance of the lithosphere uh, that you, know, uh, you might really have to get from MT data. So here's, here's a, a plot of conductance of, of the uh, continental lithosphere beneath North America obtained from inverting, simultaneously inverting a subset of all of the um, Earth scope uh, long period MT data. And the uh, conductance of the oceans is plotted on the same scale there. And you can see that, that, the, that the reddest colors are things like the North American Central Plains anomaly. And that, you know, the Western US, the conductance of the lithosphere is, it's, it's less than the ocean, but it's not totally less. And there's also really high conductivities uh, in the Eastern US beneath the Appalachians. So there, the point is, is that, you know, and I'm sure that this is true all around the globe that, that, you know, the lithosphere can have very dramatic variations in conductivity. So these thin sheet models that we're using that account for the oceans are really only part of the story. So, um, you know, we need to improve that. Um, so uh, I wanna come back and sort of say a few more words about maybe go back to the classical terminology so BZ has two components. Um, in if you read the original sort of works of uh, Schmucker and Vidal and all of these people, it, BZ is thought of as having an anomalous component, which is the tipper, which is related to lateral conductivity variations, and a normal component, which is due to non-uniformity of the source. And this is the C response or the horizontal spatial gradient approach. Um, so BZ is, can be produced by either of those two types of, uh, of situation. One, lateral variations in conductivity with a very large sp spatial scale source, and one due to the horizontal spatial gradient. And th this is just to sort of go back to that previous picture and show you, remind you what tipper is. I guess everybody listening to this knows about tipper, that this is just plotting the tippers from the Earthscope data on top of that conductance model. And you can sort of see these very large tippers in places where we would expect them, where there are very large uh, uh, condu conductivity anomalies in the, in the lithosphere. Um, 
So, I mean, I think you can pretty much infer that the 1D local inversions, which, we which I showed uh, using our source estimates, failed pretty much due to contamination of normal BZ by the anomalous components. So what I want to now ask is, can we use this source model to maybe help us separate these anomalous and normal components? Um, and I think more broadly, and this is something that I'm just starting to think about, how can we use these transfer function ideas, which have, have you know, been so useful to us in the induction community. And I, I mean, by this, I mean both the tipper and horizontal spatial gradient together with realistic source models to, to, to make progress on understanding deeper conductivity in the earth. So I'm just gonna show you some preliminary uh, tantalizing modeling results, which are uh, necessarily overly simplified. Um, so the first thing I wanna show you is a really crude synthetic modeling test. This is another checkerboard, but this is a really extreme one. It's plus and minus one order of magnitude. And uh, it's from zero to 250 kilometers depth. And uh, it comes right to the surface. So it's gonna have a really big tipper response. Uh, and, and we're you're taking this 3D, mo 3D model and we're uh, running a 3D modeling code with, with the realistic source fields that we determined from um, uh, inverting the, from the, what I talked about in the beginning of the talk. So here, here are the secondary fields which are plotted for one cycle per day, BX and BZ. Um, uh, and that's taking the total fields from the 3D model and subtracting the 1D reference total fields. So these are the scattered secondary fields. Uh, and you can see both the normal and the anomalous BZ uh, kind of pretty clearly in, in these secondary field plots. You can also see the source uh, quite clearly in these plots because like, for example, the difference between where it's blue and where it's red is, is because of the phase of, of the source. Um, if you do take the same things, except now this is actually two cycles per day with the same checkerboard model, and you don't subtract off the, uh, the uh, um, primary field, so you're not looking at the secondary field, you actually can't easily see any of the conductivity variations in these total field plots. So these total field plots are really totally dominated by the source, source variations, which is not too surprising. Um, so um, I talked about two different kinds of transfer functions and they both sort of come with an idealized horizontal magnetic field spatial pattern. Um, so for MT, we assume a uniform uh, source and uh, I'm, I'm plotting kind of the, the vectors actually in spherical coordinates uh, for a rectangular patch on the equator. And on the left, they're uniform north-south and uniform east-west. And I guess the patch is something like 20 kilometers by, I mean, 20 degrees by 20 degrees. Um, in addition to the uniform source, which is what we are used to using for MT, the next kind of order of approximation, uh, the next higher spatial complexity are the uh, curl-free gradients. So there are three gradient components. Um, and in fact, this, this one here, which uh, uh, this upper, upper right one is, is the, the gradient component that's used for the horizontal spatial gradient transfer function. And there are two other, uh, other gradient components, which uh, over a purely one dimensional earth, uh, pure, the, the, these should have no, no BZ at the center of the array. So, um, so re really the idea is that you really want BZ, you, the horizontal spatial gradient wants to know have BZ at the center of this, of this pattern. And it, these are magnetic fields that I'm plotting. And if actually, if you think of what the, what, what the electric fields would look like, the current system that would be associated with these magnetic fields, it would be a gigantic loop current flowing around the center point. So basically uh, the HSG method, the source for the HSG method is in some sense a, a giant loop current. Um, if you move to a different place on the sphere, uh, you, you can do everything the same. I mean, I'm actually being a little bit careless here using Cartesian notation and actually talking about the sphere, but uh, I didn't want to sort of complicate it with all of the correct forms for these things uh, in spherical coordinates. Um, but you can easily, um, by rotations and things, work out what 
what the, the canonical patterns of gradient free, curl free gradients would be. And this is what the pattern of, of the truly uniform source would be uh, on the Earth. So in other words, it's not uniform in uh, local geomagnetic coordinates or anything like that. It really has to have this kind of curvature in it to really be uh, truly uniform. Um, something we should be doing in our uh, 3D inversions, by the way, um, if we have large, large areas. Um, so so um, what I want to do is I want to see, can I sort out these uh, uh, components, these plane wave and gradient components uh, from the modeled synthetics? So I have 20, I have synthetic results for 20 modes. Um, the 20 modes that I estimated for each frequency band. And here I'm showing results for two, two cycles per day that best approximate the idealized uniform north, south, and east, west, the MT sources, plus the canonical gradients within a, this 20 by degree by 20 degree patch. And I'm going to do this for each point on the sphere independently. So for each point, I'm going to take the linear combination of the modes, which best matches the in horizontal speed, the horizontal field patterns. And then I'm going to plot the resulting BZ that's computed from those modes at the center of the local patch. And you can sort of already see what I'm going to show you. I've been seeing it for a while. Uh, I have the, for the uniform north-south and the uniform east-west, uh, and this very extreme example, uh, you see very clearly the tipper. You see the you see the edges of the blocks with uh, polarization reversed on opposite sides of the contact, whether it's con conductive resistive or resistive conductive. And for the horizontal spatial gradient mode, which is down here, um, you see the blocks themselves very clearly. And uh, this is actually scaled so that it is the C response. And so the units of this are in kilometers. And um, what we haven't done yet, uh, which I was trying to get done before this, but didn't, is to actually see how well this works, uh, both in terms of, you know, like kind of the Schmucker Rho star, Z star type inversions, or a, or a real 1D inversion, to see whether or not you can actually get, uh, recover the 1D conductivity reasonably from this, but I didn't get that far yet. Um, let, let me also just say that, remember that there were three canonical curl-free gradients and you can do this for all three of them. And this is the horizontal spatial gradient on the left. And this is the one where you see the blocks very clearly. In the other modes, which should be zero in principle, you actually tend to see source more than anything. So if you look at this, you can certainly see the, electro, the equatorial electrojet in this. Not so clearly, but you can certainly see where the electrojet is. Um, and in this one, actually, interestingly, which I don't completely understand myself yet, uh, in the real part, you certainly see the corners of the blocks, which is kind of interesting. So really, there's information in all of these uh, about three-dimensional structure. And, and also, as you can sort of see, you can see the electrojet quite clearly in, in like this one down here. So there's still some source in this, but most of the source has been canceled out, as we normally do with transfer functions. So this is just another synthetic test, the last of these. So I did the, we did the checkerboard with a more uh, reasonable amplitude of half an order of magnitude, plus or minus, relative to the background. And uh, we also included the ocean continent layer. Um, and this is one cycle per day. And, uh, you know, uh, you actually, uh, in, in the real part of TY, so the TY would be the north, the currents flowing east, north, south, east, west magnetic field. Oops. You, you can see the block edges somewhat. Um, and you can also, if you look very carefully at this, you can see the blocks in this horizontal spatial gradient thing. For example, uh, notice the difference between uh, Western Australia and Eastern Australia, and that corresponds to where it's resistive in Eastern Australia. So the penetration depth, which is what the real part of C of omega can be interpreted as, is greater in Western Australia than in Eastern Australia. And you can actually see if you look at this carefully, you can see all of these, all, you can actually see all of the blocks uh, in this. But you can also, of course, quite clearly see uh, the thin sheet in this because that also is influencing the horizontal spatial gradient response. So you need to do 1D inversions. 
So um, I, I guess uh, uh, one thing that we want to look at and test soon is whether this plane wave and gradient separation uh, could make 1D inversion of GDS more useful. But uh, of course, I would still advocate full 3D inversion. Uh, why not? We can. But I think that actually being able to look at, um, you know, to divide things up and use these transfer function ideas will really help us evaluate and understand uh, resolution and what we can really trust in our models. So I think it's a useful idea. So I, I want to talk just a little bit about source models at continental scale. Um, because I think a, a lot of times, I think we're, we're gonna really want to maybe work at that scale, not globally. There's just too many holes in the global uh, compilation <coughs> until we can get satellite data used effectively. So, and it's simple, at mid latitudes, uh, simpler models uh, are, are likely sufficient for, for modeling the source field. And in particular, this kind of idea of the uniform plus gradient at, at the scale of the whole continent uh, captures most of the variance. Um, I have evidence that there are, I think, field aligned currents that are also a significant component uh, that may also want to be included. But I think you might be able to make uh, localized models that, are, uh, that can take advantage of the fact that there's maybe higher densities of data in some areas like Europe and North America, uh, uh, China, and so on. Um, and you can sort of embed these kind of regional scale models in a global source model to reduce boundary effects. So I, I still think that the, it's going to be very valuable to have these global models, um, not just at the daily variation band, but in other frequency bands, which I'll say a few words about later. So, so just to sort of show you what I'm talking about, about this plane wave and gradient thing, th th this is a, an array of 14, 14 sites in the continental US, uh, the geomagnetic observatories uh, in, Southern Canada and, and the US, um, which are the blue, and the Earthscope backbone uh, MT sites, which are the red. And uh, th those were multi-year applications, uh, but they had many, many large gaps. But, it, but it's a pretty reasonably uniform uh, spread of sites with three or so years of data, and more if you count the observatories, uh, more for the observatories, I should say. And uh, the, 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 the bottom line is, is that, uh, uh, I'm doing this principal components analysis that I th I've done forever, um, and you can explain 95% of the variance over most of the frequency band over say from once you get out of the dead band. Uh, so in the usual long period MT band through the daily variation band, 95% of the variance can be explained by five or maybe 10 at most modes uh, or more. Okay, and the first five spatial modes look like this, and uh, I'm plotting here both um, the, the magnetics at the way that I did before, but in green, and the dashed are the imaginary and the, the real or the solid. I'm also plotting the electrics from the, the backbone MT and uh, the vertical magnetic field in, as a blue uh, ellipses where the, si the size is the amplitude and the phase is indicated by that little clock hand hard to sort of see, but uh, my, the, my main point is to try to emphasize that, 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 that out of those modes, you can really kind of construct the basic, that they really are linear combinations of, of these idealized basis functions, uniform plane wave and curl-free gradients. Um, and uh, this is just the linear combination of eight modes, the first eight modes, which best matches this. And I'm gonna to toggle back and forth. And if you focus on the green arrows, um, uh, of course, the MT uh, results are not going to be very similar to the idealized 1D, but the, but the magnetics are. And if you sort of, you can see that the spatial pattern of the magnetic fields is quite similar, not perfectly exact, but quite similar uh, to the idealized um, uh, and, and what you can sort of form out of that. So th what this sort of shows is that most of the signal is really what can be represented in this kind of relatively simple, large scale, uniform plus gradient, accounting for spherical effects and all of that to do it carefully. Uh, beyond that, there are a few modes, which, uh, so these are the, 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 the spatial patterns of magnetic and electric fields that are, uh, 
have the most variance after you've taken out these plane wave and gradient components. And it's kind of, I find it quite interesting because you see these kind of uh, streaks of, of alternating uh, direction. So the, the magnetic fields are mostly east-west, not exactly, but mostly east-west. Um, and they, you know, in, in one longitude, they're all pointing in the same direction and they kind of reverse um, and then reverse again as you go further east. And uh, if you look at a whole bunch of periods, you see basically the same general pattern. So again, uh, on, the, on the west coast, things are pointing to the west. You go a little further east in the US, things are pointing to the east. You go further and things are pointing to the west again. And my interpretation of this is that these are shorter meridional wavelength field line components. And you actually sort of see similar patterns at a very large range of periods. So I think, you know, working again with, with sort of maybe some conceptual models or maybe with some numerical models, we, we could include in a regional model some of these additional components and improve, capture some more of the variability uh, to have a better regional source model. Um, uh, why do I want to maybe do this? Well, you know, we have a whole bunch of uh, long period uh, MT sites uh, with, with BZ also uh, at, say, the Earthscope site. And we have observatories, uh, which we can use to construct kind of uh, this kind of, uh, re, you know, regional scale model. Um, and uh, if you could model the source as uniform plus gradients, you can then use that source model to find what you sort of actually see at the Earthscope sites for those particular source patterns. And so this is this was done, I did this a while ago, uh, and Ben Murphy has followed up on this and done this a little more for more of the sites. I, I, I should point out that there's a hole in this array, uh, which was from the first year of the Earthscope uh, project, when in fact um, the USGS was not routinely collecting one hertz data. So I, uh, and, and making one hertz data available. So I didn't have, I didn't have the data necessary to do the global model, the continental scale model uh, for the first year of the Earthscope project. Actually, that's all been fixed by now and that could be done. Uh, and then this is the vertical fields. And I guess I, 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 wanna, I don't wanna go into this too much, but so this is kind of tipper and this is horizontal spatial gradient, but it is a little bit more complicated in this case I, because I haven't, what I really should do is I should take this source model, which is, which says, that over the whole area, you can model things in terms of a small number of basis functions, namely uniform and gradients over the whole area. But you should recenter the, the gradient calculation for each location uh, to do what I was talking about uh, in the global daily variation model for those other plots. So I, that hasn't been done yet. Uh, but I think that the idea is, is we could get uh, horizontal spatial, we could use a reliable source model to get horizontal spatial gradients at estimates at a large number of these uh, Earthscope sites. And we could get sort of an independent, somewhat independent uh, uh, induction parameter to, that, that is not affected at all by surface distortion and statics to, to compare to uh, some of our results that we're getting from MT. I'm sure that the MT is more useful but I think that this would be a useful addition. Um, I wanna sort of say that there's similar results were obtained in a paper with Hui Wang uh, from China. And there's actually a lovely uh, array of, of magnetometers and electrometers in China that are run by the China Earthquake Administration. And uh, basically the same results, the similar results are obtained there actually even cleaner because China's really kind of lower geomagnetic latitude than uh, North America, than continental US. Um, uh, you, could, you could fantasize, I'll just say, about um, using these ideas with the Sinoprobe data. But right now, I think it's a fantasy. OK, I want to I want to say uh, uh, that there's a lot, in addition to observatories, there's a lot of long period geomagnetic data that can be used for this source model. Of course, the observatories are the highest quality data, but there have been many, many, many um, uh, space physics experiments 
especially in uh, in North America, uh, but also uh, in parts of Europe. Um, uh, and uh, you can really fill in the observatory array with uh, some of these things. And many of these many of these sites have been occupied for multiple years. Uh, uh, many of them have really very good quality variometer data. So there's not absolute baseline control, but I think for the variations that we want to study for uh, EM induction, um, as long as we don't go to too long a period where the flux gates maybe crap out on uh, temperature effects, uh, I think, I think you know, we can use a lot of this data uh, to improve the source model. So I wanna say just a couple of words about incorporating satellite data which is ongoing work that Patrick Alkin at University of Colorado and NOAA is taking the lead on. And um, I, I, I sort of showed this equation before of the daily variation model in time. Um, but um, th the point is, is that once you have a, a model represented in time, you can, you, you know, you, you could try to uh, fit time domain satellite data. And look, the way that I wanna look at this now is, is that this is an observation equation for the time domain magnetic fields. The, the spatial structure, the spatial structure functions are coming from the TIE. Um, the, the temporal mode variations are coming from the ground data where we have very good resolution of time. And we're now leaving the expansion coefficients as something that has to be estimated. So this becomes an observation equation, just a linear uh, for a linear model for estimating the expansion coefficients in this time domain magnetic field model that can be fit to satellite data and ground data also, because we also have constraints on the, on the structure of the magnetic field on the ground. And so this is something that we're definitely interested in trying to make work. Um, it's been challenging, I'll just say. Um, one of the key points that we have to do uh, for this is we can't work with this 2D uh, source model anymore. We now need, if we're going to sort of include satellite data, we now need a 3D model of the current systems. And actually this is a, you know, potentially very valuable and interesting to uh, the ionospheric uh, and magnetospheric communities to sort of, you know, have data constrained models of, uh, of the currents in the source regions. So, uh, this is sort of one of the modes from doing this kind of uh, principal components analysis of the model outputs, but but now for uh, now for uh, the 3D current system, uh, and this is the current at three components of the current at um, 110 kilometers altitude, and this is just a, a, another mode, the mode three, um, and, and it, it really is 3D as you can sort of see. There is a JR component over the electrojet, which. Uh, appears realistic according to the ionospheric physicists. Well, it's their model, so they think it's realistic. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna say a few words about ongoing efforts and I'll, and I'll be finishing up. So uh, I think the most critical thing and the most interesting thing and, and the most challenging thing is to incorporate satellite data. And if we can figure out how to do this, uh, and I think the transfer function ideas are gonna play a key role uh, for actually getting, you know, say, see responses from satellite data spatially localized over the oceans. Uh, I think that's a potentially a breakthrough in terms of sort of earth induction studies, if we can solve all the problems, if somebody can solve all the problems. Um, uh, I'm also involved in a project uh, which is modeling storms for uh, geomagnetically induced currents with Patrick Alkin again and Astrid Mote and Gong Lu, Anna Kelbert and Josh Riegler. Um, uh, I'm, I, sh I showed you sort of some very preliminary results of 1D inversion in the daily variation band. Uh, obviously, we want to go on to 3D inversion, uh, and that's work with Sean V. Chen. And then um, something that I'm working on right now, and I actually was hoping to have, hoping to show you a movie of the long period variations based upon TIGCM, but you'll have to wait till tomorrow to see that because it didn't quite get there. Uh, but uh, I think I showed you plenty of stuff. So, uh, so I, 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 I showed you a model of the, of the daily variations, which is 10 to the fourth to 10 to the fifth seconds. I now have, I'm now working on a model which goes from 10 to the fifth to several times 10 to the sixth, 
uh, with this long period and as part of the GIC, a model that's going from 300 seconds to 10,000 seconds. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of work to do and uh, uh, anybody can participate. Um, so I think that I'd like to summarize and conclude. Uh, I think we can build useful models of external source fields at both global and regional scales. And I think, um, I think that these will allow improved use of these GDS or MV methods uh, which will allow us to see uh, somewhat deeper and also maybe provide distortion-free um, constraints on conductivity, TE mode only constraints on conductivity uh, of the lithosphere at large scales. Um, and and um, I, I really think that, you know, uh, not just, you know, I really think that we don't want to forget about these transfer function methods, which have served us so well. And I think that they're really going to be key to making them the best use of these source models too. Um, and then finally, um, I, there's lots of applications for good models of time varying magnetic fields, you know, in, from, from navigation and directional drilling uh, to GIC, uh, to just scientific studies of, of, of the sources that, uh, and, I, and I think it's really, of course, key to, to further advances with satellite magnetometry. So I, I mean, and I think that we'll be surprised if if we if we build it, that will come. Um, and there's a huge potential benefit in working with space physics modelers. In fact, they're probably really they're probably really the core of this, and they probably really are the ones that are going to be taking the lead on this. But uh, the induction community also has a role to play, and so I think it's good to sort of stay involved and keep our minds on this. So I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you very much, Gary. Absolutely wonderful to see how far this has gone. You know, I mean, I played around with the ionospheric uh, interaction back in the late uh, 70s, early 80s, when I was in Scandinavia as part of the IMS. And um, it was very primitive, the stuff we were doing at the time. <laughs> um, one quick question dating back from what I learned at that time, though. There was a number of papers that came out talking about the uh, interaction between conductivity structure and, uh, and ionospheric current systems. And there was, uh, there was some papers that showed that ionospheric current systems seem to mimic the geometry of the Northern European, Northern Russian coastline. So would your modeling allow a feedback like that, that the current- well, I mean I'm dubious, and I all of the ionospheric people I talk to are are highly dubious. I mean, I mean, I mean, you realize? I mean, I, sh I should say that the TIE GCM um, is is the the TIE model is 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 the TIE GCM leaving out the E <laughs> uh, is, is this uh, atmospheric model, which, right? You know, models right. models. You know. Um, Ionization, which models ionization, and it has a whole bunch yeah. of you know ion species, and you know models their ionization and recombination, and you know the the neutral winds and how those things move around, and the radiational forcing from from the lower atmosphere. I mean, I mean the forcing from the lower at, lower atmosphere, and, and all that. And then then when they want to compute electric currents, that's that isn't actually an output of their model. That's a separate post processing step. Because the electric currents are computed with an electrodynamics module separately, and that's because they do not believe that dB has a substantive dynamic feedback. dB in the ionosphere has any substantial uh, dynamic feedback into the into the general circulation model. And I think that they, you know, can analyze the size of the terms that they're modeling in their models and analyze the size of the, you know, Lorentz forces and all that and conclude that, <laughs> that they're just not, not worth including. So in other words, they do it in a two-step a two step procedure. Do you understand what I'm yeah, 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 And yeah. I was just, already just having a discussion with Astrid today because I thought she was saying something else and she quickly corrected me to, no, 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 that's, that's, not, that's not what I meant. <laughs> okay. but, 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 you know, I, I think that as we get, you know, I, I mean, I, I think, I, I don't think that the ionospheric physicists know all of, it all of everything about all of this stuff and you know they they still use they still use uh, 
you know, a perfect conductor at 600 right. kilometers depth yeah. as if they want to include internal fields in right. their, in their calculation, you know, they just, because that's very simple. It's, a, you know, it's a, it's right. a zero phase, you know, just a scale factor, you know, just right. spatial filter kind of, but with no, right. a real spatial filter that's really simple to apply. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now disconnects have uh, been around for 40 years, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that that's another point. And of course, of course, uh, of course, you know, I, I mentioned that we're, you know, have a project with Anna Kelbert and Josh Riegler at USGS and the ionospheric physics people who were working on the DV thing to, to, to look at, you know, to do this kind of stuff with storms and, and also to study more carefully the interactions, you know, uh, I mean, the interactions of source with GIC. In other right. words, uh, do we have to, can we use these MT impedances just, yeah. or is it, is it, does it sometimes get a little bit more complicated? Uh, so, you know, I mean, it's an opportunity, uh, I would say. I, I would say that it's an opportunity to explore those things because the ionospheric physicists, I would say, don't think that that's an issue, <laughs> but they right. might not be right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, we have a question from uh, Dennis Woods. Hey, Dennis, great to see you here. Um, do you think it would be useful to record VX, BY, BZ over a small spatial area surrounding an empty station simultaneously with the empty recording in order to obtain the local the horizontal spatial gradient transfer function in addition to the normal transfer function for that station? And if so, useful for what scale of exploration, e.g. regional mineral exploration? Well, uh, um... I actually doubt it, but I, yeah. I, but I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I think one thing is that this HSG response is kind of going down in amplitude as as frequency goes up. So so it's so you know there's just you know there's just not a big. I mean you know it's just kind of like the well I mean the response is proportional to the skin depth. <laughs> yeah. I mean if you scale it, it's just in kilometers, right? So so if you're only seeing a kilometer down, I mean you would have to have a really extraordinary signal to noise ratio. But, but also I think the other thing is, is that um, uh, the source itself, I, I think, except in some special cases. So I, I, I argue that we could model at continental scale with this um, you know, very large scale plane wave and gradient over the whole continent. That's obviously not true for everything because pulsations have smaller spatial scales. And in fact, you can actually see that in some of the results yeah. that I look at in these things, you can find pulsations there that are just not fit by the principal components of the of the of the larger array at all. Um, but 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 the the source itself is mostly, and I and it, you know I mean as you get to higher frequencies, this is certainly not it's certainly totally different source. So you would have to look at this. Uh, but but I I kind of doubt it. But uh, but it you know you, you might be able to get some information about deeper structure, and it might be worth. Look, it might be worth doing some calculations to see how it would work, but I, I don't think so. I, I thought it would be yeah. great if it was true. I thought of that too, but I don't think it's. Likely. Yeah, I think I think for regional mineral exploration, we're talking about gradients from lightning storms, so you have to be within twenty five kilometers. Yeah, you'd have to be very close to the lightning storm. storm. Yeah, and then you might not have any instruments left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is there any more questions from the audience? I think. Uh, this is uh, new to a lot of people, so they're, they're trying to digest it all. One, qu one quick question is, um, you, you gave a, a wonderful, you know, early on in the talk, you showed potential for mapping lateral variation of hydration of the transition zone, but you didn't come back to that. Well, I mean, th that's, what the, that's what the 3D, that's, that's what you would have to do with 3D, with 3D inversion yeah. for. I mean, and I guess, I guess my point, I mean, there was, I mean, I, I showed the results of Anna Kelbert's paper. Um, and, you know, I mean, it made, it made sense because the most, because the most hydrated area was, um, you know, uh, Eastern Asia, where, you know, you have stagnant uh, right. slabs, slabs stagnating in the transition zone. And you've got, you know, you've also got this, you know, old, cold Pacific plate, which could hold a lot of water and, 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 mineral phases, which could be stable to pretty far down, potentially, more than in a lot of other places. So it made sense. 
Um, but there's not, there wasn't, I mean, the problem is the data wasn't, to me, the, the, that, that's that been sort of the mo motivation partly is to sort of have a good model that, of the daily variation band where we could do 3D inversions. And so, yes, that's on the plate. That's on the, that's on the, I mean, that's certainly something that we're interested in doing to come back to that very idea. Okay, Gary, I think uh, you've not got any more questions. So it's, we're over the time. I'd like to thank you again for this wonderful talk. And I'm sure that there's gonna be a lot of people will be approaching you as they watch the recording. This this will be up on the MTNet within a couple of hours and Gary's gonna send me his PDF. I'll put that up as well. So, so thank you very convert, much. You want me to convert it to a PDF? I guess it's smaller that way. Yeah, send it as a PDF. I mean, uh, will that will that embed the movies too, or do you want not worried about those? Mm, yeah, mm, but the, mm. <laughs> yeah. it's pretty big. It's pretty big yeah. with the movies. Isn't it? Yeah, perhaps we don't need the movies because people can watch the recording to get the movies. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks everybody, and I'll thanks again, Gary. Great, and I'll see everyone next week for Jared Peacock. Bye. Bye.